Um, thank you for coming back. So nobody here, as far as I can tell, works on language or anything even remotely related. Uh, so let me start by giving a public service message first. And the public service message is this. How naive do you think we're allowed to be? So when you go to a talk on vision, it typically starts with this. Right? So you get the visual system from the ganglion cells up to high order areas, and nobody is surprised because the visual system of the primate is complicated anatomically and physiologically, and you say, of course, vision is complicated, so it's like that. And when you go to an auditory talk, God forbid, <laughs> you also get something like this. This is the structure of the auditory system, but actually only the brainstem. So you can see this was made by, <laughs> this was made by somebody who's excited about the brainstem, and auditory cortex is up here. <laughs> um, but again, you don't have any problem saying, well, obviously, hearing is complicated and has lots of moving parts. And then you go to a talk on language, and you get this. <laughs> and I mean, if it's, it's disturbing. Uh, and if there's anything you're going to remember you know, in the remaining hour and a half that I have, um, it should be that this, while it has done a remarkable amount of historical work and been great, uh, it's also wrong, and you should discard it from, so flush it out of your, your uh, or empty your trash or whatever. Uh, Josh Tenenbaum just said, I should empty my trash. So, but you're familiar with this because every textbook in linguistics, psychology, neuroscience has this famous picture. And of course, it's, a, it's marvelous. It assumed that there's such a thing as a Broca's area and such a thing as a Wernicke's area and an arrow. That's all nice and good. Um, it's been, and it's still the canonical model. And it's, if you have a stroke right now and you end up in the hospital, you will be diagnosed and treated on the basis of this. But this is from 1861. So that should make you nervous, I, I think. Um, why is this? Well, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful and stimulated a lot of work, but I mean, even Broca's area doesn't exist. It's really Broca's region. It has probably a dozen different areas as part of it. And so if you make some kind of generalizations that are coarse, uh, as the famous physics line goes, it's not even wrong. So yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it's appalling. So you have to run for the hills. And likewise, you know, if you just do, if you want to look at where in the brain has uh, is there activation in response to any kind of language task? Uh, Kathy Price did a nice thing. It's everywhere. The entire brain, more or less, is activated by language. It sort of looks like Europe in 1648. <laughs> um, and moreover, the right hemisphere has been rehabilitated too. So it's, so it's more like uh, Europe and Asia in 1648. So our generalizations have simply been uh, unsophisticated, you know, have been wonderful idealizations, but so coarse as to be, unfortunately, no longer useful. So you can forget everything else I say, but please do remember that just as a kind of pedagogical point. Now, um, what we, so why is it a problem? Is that even something very banal, like recognizing a single word, is supported by very complicated architecture. And since we're at Irvine, I thought I'd show the Irvine model, which is this one, which comes from Greg Hickok, who's a professor here, and me. And that shows you basically the architecture of the minimal amount of junk you need in your head to recognize a word or two. So that's a lot. It's in both hemispheres, and it's all over the place. And in particular, it's organized uh, more or less like the visual system. There's a dorsal stream. This little pointer isn't particularly awesome. It's, 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 it's very subtle. The big thing, oh yeah, the lightsaber. <laughs> so there's a dorsal stream. Much, you know, which we literally stole from the visual system. There's a ventral stream. No, this is also not awesome. Um, and it's organized in both hemispheres. And that's just the minimal architecture. So if you want to have something uh, in terms of the functional organization of language, it's obviously much more complicated. Um, you should not believe me, of course. I mean, you're allowed to believe me, but you shouldn't. But you can, uh, but it's, ours is not the only story. There is a, basically a bunch of stories of this form uh, that are typically called dual stream models. Josef Rauschecker and uh, Sophie Scott have one, Angela Friderizzi, and there's many others. And there's pretty much consensus that that's the minimum amount of organization that you need. So please remember that and put the other thing to bed for now and cite us often. <laughs> 
or follow me on Twitter. As uh, my friend John Krakauer says, it's the new H index. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, functional anatomy is useful, but an anatomy is destiny, but it's not explanation. And one of the things uh, I want to uh, uh, remind you of and talk about a bit is what might we think of as an explanation, because what we're doing is it's not so obvious. So, I mean, I build little box models like that because I think it's cool and it's consistent with imaging and lesion data, and you can do it for lexical semantics. Or you can go all out, and you can, let's say you're Jack Gallant and you want to do the most sophisticated cutting edge signal processing, and you end up with that. Now, that's cool and it's interesting, but is it an explanation? And if yes, of what? It's not at all clear. So it's an extremely complicated uh, activation pattern of where in the head there are words. So everywhere is the answer. Uh, now, have you learned something either about cognition or about how the brain works or about any kind of model or about computation? And I submit that no, and I think Jack will agree. I mean, he's excited by the modeling, but I think he understands that this is not an account of anything. So my first conclusion, coming to the conclusions, um, is that um, is what we might think of as the maps problem, is we use the most sophisticated technologies to make maps of, of uh, different perceptual cognitive functions, but a localization is not an explanation. I mean, we all know that, and yet we do it all the time. Right? So we do an imaging study, and we show a blob, and you say, well, okay, well, that's great. Uh, but localization is not explanation, dear students and dear colleagues. Um, so let's turn to part two. The, which we can call the mapping problem, which is a little bit different. So the mapping problem is, well, how do we actually align what we think of the parts list of the domain or the primitives or the ontological structure of the things? And that's quite difficult. So uh, I see my own job more or less as being a mechanic, as our job is to figure out what are the smallest parts in some domain. I work on speech perception, language comprehension. So I want to know what are the primitives. and. Um, well, how would I do that? I mean, a really good idea, or you know, a plausible one, would be good to say the Linguistic Society of America, and say, well, all of you, members of the Linguistic Society of America, or Britain, or Deutsche Gesellschaft für Sprachforschung, what are the primitives that you need to account for any phenomenon in language research? And they're going to come up with something like that, right? So, no, they're these are the neuroscientists. The neuroscientists are going to come up with something like this. The linguists are going to come up with something like the list on the left that I can't point to with either weapon. <laughs> okay. uh, so linguists, will, they traffic in things like the notion of a distinctive feature, which has to do with phonology or timing slots, the notion of a morpheme, a phrase, operations like uh, merge or concatenation. And obviously, the, there's debates about these, right? So, you know, different linguistic theories and different traditions have a kind of different way of, of uh, granulating this, but it, this is sort of the flavor of the concepts. And likewise, this is sort of the primitives of neuroscience, right? So we think about, let's say, the dendritic spine is one of the elements, or a cortical column, or the notion of, let's say, adaptation or something like that. And that's all nice and good, and we probably believe that. So I'm a neuroscientist, and I think this is totally reasonable. And I work with linguists, and I believe that they're reasonable people. And this is why we're here, right? So this is the, what was conventionally known as the mind-body problem. And we're supposedly here figuring this problem out. And I figured out a lot of it today, but not everything yet, because I still haven't the vaguest idea how these things are linked. I mean, not the vaguest. Right? So for any of these items that I'm trying to account for, that form the basis of how we deal with linguistic phenomena, I don't know how it maps to anything in neuroscience. And that's a bummer and shows how bankrupt our, at least my field is. You guys might be better off, but there's no game in town here, right? So we should just go home. <laughs> and that is because there are basically no linking hypotheses. Is we have no convincing links between the inventory or the ontological structure of the primitives of one domain and the other domain. Uh, you know, the parts lists or the atoms, whatever you want to call it. And uh, you should, that should disappoint you. That should, that should bother you. I mean, it bothers me. It's not just true for the language domain. This is just a, you know, it's a feature of how we do cognitive science. Now, you might say, because you're, uh, you know, probably neuro-imperialists, that the right way to go is to be a reductionist. 
the, everything we see here on the side of the, let's say, the psychological side should be reduced to the neurobiological side. So there should be some kind of uh, classic reduction. And then you say, well, you know, that's how science works. And I tell you, it is not how it works. So take C. elegans. C. elegans is a creature that's fully understood at the biological level. Every cell, every connection, the genome. And we don't know squat about how that worm works. And that also should worry you. So it should concern you that we don't have a model of how the worm does what it does, knowing everything about the wiring diagram. Absolutely. There's a positive message. There's a, there, this is going, uh, don't worry, this is, I'm not a total nihilist. Um, this is, uh, there, there will be positive messages, but, you're, but Rich is absolutely right. You should figure this out. Please figure this out. I mean, figure out how we can have a worm that has only 300 cells and a fully known wiring diagram, and you don't know. The only circuit that's well understood is the defecation circuit. Now, that's admittedly very important and a lovely thing. But I think our, our ambition, our yearning should be higher. And that's, you know. So, I mean, my colleague, Tony Moshin, uh, says, um, it's fair to say that our understanding of the worm has not been materially enhanced by having the connectome available to us. We don't have a comprehensive model of how the worm's nervous system actually produces the behaviors and so on and so forth. So stuff's not good. Something rotten in the state of Denmark. Um, a philosopher, the philosophers Bennett and Hacker have a nice formulation. Cognitive neuroscience operates across the boundary between two fields, neurophysiology or whatever, and psychology, the respective concepts of which are categorially dissimilar. The logical or conceptual relations between the physiological and the psychological are problematic. The relations between the mind and the brain are bewildering, and they continue to be bewildering at 3 p.m. Now, um, the, so I just gave you this little example, so you can have the uh, kind of uh, parts list of neuroscience and some aspect of psychology. So whether, it doesn't matter whether you study attention or language or concepts. Um, we just don't know how to do, how to do it. And what we then do, we have sort of surrogate research programs. So one, you know, one that I always use is, well, let's just go MAR. So there's a computational level of analysis, an algorithmic level of analysis, and an implementational one. And I think that's, that turns out to be very useful, and then we can quibble about the details. That, uh, but now, when I go to neuroscience meetings, the favorite lingo these days is, uh, let's have a mesoscopic level. As if that were, that's like localization. A mesoscopic level of coding is an explanation. But that's also false, because we just don't have any proper linking hypotheses. So we're, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. So the mapping problem is the, how can we actually have any kind of productive linking hypothesis between the stuff of biology and the stuff of thought, assuming that they're the same, uh, the same unless we're dualists, which actually is a reasonable argument. So you could also just be a dualist. Then you're home free. Then just do biology of the brain and don't worry about the stuff that we're worrying about here. It's, a, it's probably a better thing. Um, so I want to revisit, I, I want to so not be completely depressing. I want to uh, give you one ex experimental example, or series of experimental examples of trying to build what is an ultimately unsuccessful linking hypothesis, but at least sort of outline um, how one might try. So we've done anatomy, a little philosophy, so let's do physiology. Um, so for the sake of argument, let's adopt the MAR thing, right? So the MAR... Computational level of analysis, algorithmic level, uh, implementation level. And I assume everyone has read this. And if you have not, let's say the first two chapters of, of David Marr's book, Vision, run, go. Or download it right now onto your cell phone or something. You should, those of you who haven't looked at it, you should, that should be part of your vocabulary as cognitive scientists. OK, so let's go back to the little exercise. Here's language and a bunch of the primitives of language. So. The notion of a phoneme, the notion of a morpheme, the notion of a clause. And if you want, I may, I I've been doing a lot of work on music lately, so you can do the same exercise for music. The, a primitive might be something like an octave-based pitch scale, a discrete time interval, um, a motif, things like that. So those are the, those are the pieces, or the, the Lego blocks, which musicologists use to basically account for the phenomena of music, of composition, and of, of reception. Um, so those are the representational primitives. And 
presumably these are domain specific, right? So there's no way to translate between these. These are particular to either processing, uh, pr perceiving or producing music or speech and language. Now, from the implementational point of view, that's the brain, right? So there's nothing specific about, let's say, your earlobes, or there's nothing domain specific about your cochlea and so on. But at some level, things must be cached out, the terminal elements in some ways that, that are surprisingly specific. But what are we missing in the middle is some of the processes that take you, uh, in, let's say, in, in perception, from the chunks that come in uh, to the chunks that uh, do the, the biology, so the algorithms. And one way uh, to approach the problem is to figure out, well, what kind of circuits and what kind of activity lies at the, at the and what kind of dynamics sort of underpin these things. And I want to give just one example of you know, how to think about it in the, in the domain of auditory processing, in particular with the, um, the question of how do you actually segment a continuous signal that doesn't come labeled with anything? Right? So speech, right? so this is, what, this is going to be the exercise. I'm going to try to uh, give you a little bit of evidence for, for actually entrainment and, and how it gets used to discretize an input stream. So that's going to be the experimental series. All right, so far so good? Are you depressed? All right, so let's, let's undepress. So the, uh, the premise of the experiment I'm going to show you is, uh, is that um, nervous systems have neural oscillations. And I did not just make this up. Um, this, there's a nice review article by um, Yuri Bujaki, Nikos Logothetis, and Wolf Singer from a few years ago. I mean, oscillations, when you stick an electrode in, um, appear at different scales, at different frequencies. It looks like, you know, squiggly lines that are sort of quasi-periodic. And there are different frequencies, right? So here on the y-axis is the frequency of the oscillation. And it turns out not to matter how big the brain is. It's a property of circuits that have, you know, so it's like a Lego block. If you take X number of cells and you wire them up like that to maintain homeostatic integrity, there's excitability cycles of a certain frequency. There are super fast ones and there are super slow ones. You see here in this kind of summary uh, graph, there's, um, Jesus, this is kind of, I want to get better at this, sorry. So there's very slow ones, there's very fast ones, and then there's a sort of stuff in the middle that we're going to concentrate on a little bit that you've heard about, like gamma band oscillations, theta band oscillations, and so on. So this is ubiquitous in nervous systems. It's just a feature. And the question, so the question is, is it usable? And is it used? If it's there, and if it's there for who knows what function, does it actually play any interesting role? So that's the first thing to remember. There are oscillations. Uh, I know that that's a topic that gets many people, gives many people high blood pressure. And you are entitled to own your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. So the fact that there are excitability cycles in, in uh, neurophysiology is just a fact of the matter. Okay. And you don't have to like it, but you should. So what about speech? So speech is, this is what speech is like. It comes in, speech is like trying to read this. And so try to read this, well, it's annoying. Since there are no boundaries, and blah, blah, blah. because speech comes as a continuous waveform like that, and it doesn't come pre-labeled, like this is a word, and here's a little noun, and so on. So you just get this in, this is the signal, and you have to figure out how to break it into little pieces. And the way we learn it, and we've learned it uh, by and large, is we look at something like a spectrogram that has time and frequency. And you look at little features in this uh, in the spectrogram and say, oh, look, there's little energy uh, bands that are called formants. And maybe there's a burst of energy that may be associated with a consonant. So this is the sentence, cats and crocodiles don't play together. And by going left to right, by you know, going in little time slices and analyzing that information, we sort of accumulate the evidence and try to figure out what is, let's say, a word. But you don't know what the boundaries are because nothing has a boundary. So in the last years, it's turned out that an interesting thing to look at is actually the envelope of the signal, right? So this is the energy envelope here in this kind of cartoonish thing. And that's pretty low frequency, below 20 hertz. And uh, has you know, kind of been ignored a lot, certainly in the speech recognition literature. So now here comes the fun part. Should you care about this envelope? Is that just some kind of weird, nerdy auditory guys thing? Or does it matter? So um, here's a fun thing to do. A lot fun if you were a postdoc in my lab. Um, namely, try to figure out, is there any systematicity to the envelope of the speech signal 
in general and across languages, and not just in 10 sentences, but in huge corpora. Because you might imagine, well, if I just look at the envelope of a sentence, so here's, for instance, for Mandarin, for English, and for French, and people speak at wildly different rates, you think, right? So I have an uncle who speaks kind of like this, and it's, you don't want to kill him. <laughs> but then on the other hand, my mother, who was from Venezuela, uh, spoke very, very fast, and you want to kill her for other reasons. So the, our intuition is that there's huge variability, and the question is, is this intuition correct? So you can take this, and you can uh, take the envelope of, of uh, speech of different languages that have different typological properties, actually, and try to figure out you know, what, how, how regular is this envelope. So the way to do this is not particularly germane right now. One can read about it. You take what's called the modulation spectrum. So you break a signal into its little different bands, because the ear is like the eye. It has different channels. And for each channel, you basically figure out what is the modulation frequency of that envelope. You put it back together, and you get a modulation spectrum. Now, if you do that, your intuition, if you're rational, should be it should be very different across languages, because languages are different. Some are just consonant vowel, consonant vowel, like Japanese is moraic or Chinese. And some are really fun funky, like Serbo-Croatian, which has consonant, 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 no vowel. Like the island Krk, for instance. Um, so um, if you do that, if you actually extract that and quantify it, it turns out that it's unbelievably regular. So if you don't just take 10 sentences, but thousands, if you take you know, hours of audiobooks, so that's somebody reading, sentences from the timid corpus, or actually interviews, so just people having discussion with each other, telephone conversations, and so on, so different speaking styles, the modulation spectrum of speech is way more regular than you would have thought, or certainly than I would have thought, because our hypothesis would, was that this should be totally different. So the range of speech is between four and five hertz. And so other than uh, what I said at the very beginning in my public service message about Broca's and Wernicke's area, the other public service messages, if someone asks you what's the mean rate of speech, it's between four and five hertz. You can put that in the bank. And um, so you said, oh, but that's only English. Yes, sure, reviewer number three. <laughs> uh, I can do it for many other languages, from Dutch to French. Um, then you might say, I don't like the way you do your maths. Uh, you, don't, you shouldn't believe me. The, you don't have to believe me. You can go to another person's lab, like Christian Lorenzi, and look for another family of languages, like Japanese, Basque, Zulu, Polish, and you get the same exercise. So what's the message here? The mean amplitude, the mean rate of speech across languages, if you look at the amplitude modulation rate, is between 4 and 5 hertz whether you like it or not. Okay, so that is what your brain is both producing, right? because that is what you say, but it has to be equipped to analyze that mean rate. If you can't do it, you're toast. Right? So that is something you should remember. Now, why is this a useful number? If you're, so this is just the physics of speech. right? Now, we haven't done any, any neurophysiology and any linguistics. This was just you take a signal and you try to characterize its properties, its statistics. Now, interestingly, if you go to linguistics and say, does that number remind me of anything? Well, it didn't remind anyone of anything, but it did remind me of the mean duration of syllables cross-linguistically. So that number turns out to be, uh, no matter what language you take, roughly the, so here's, for instance, German, English, Japanese. So there is a beautiful alignment between mean syllable duration and the modulation spectrum. That doesn't mean, by the way, that there's a direct mapping here. It means there's a correlation, a very high correlation, between the mean rate of speech, which is actually just your jaw opening and closing, blah, 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 right? And mean syllable duration. That's how that works. So far, so good? So the physics of speech has a certain property. It aligns really well with linguistics. Now, to preempt the question of, but what about music? I can say, yes, we've done it for music too, obviously, and it's different in a very systematic and interesting way. Music is actually, as, uh, whether it's single voice instruments, multi-voice instruments, multi-part music, and all kinds of stuff, it's, it's uh, roughly, so here's actually the distribution for speech. Here it is for music, it's a bit broader, and it's about, on the mean, two hertz. Kind of cool, 120 beats per minute. So if you want a, a kind of a poetic one-liner, um, music is faster than your heartbeat and slower than your speech. It's a good way to remember. 
Okay, so now we have a little bit about the physics of speech, a little bit of, about the linguistics of the unit size that you're trying to get. Let's measure something. Um, we want to measure a head. And Gall actually had the first very good measurements using uh, original material, and he used a hand scanner. And the hand scanner actually was, uh, I think, unfairly maligned. I mean, so people make fun of Gall's um, phrenology rightfully for the bump part of the theory. But if you read the book to the end, the organology is actually extremely sensible, right? It basically is an argument that there's a parts list of the mind, that there's a faculty psychology. And it's a little odd to just dismiss that as ridiculous. He was right. So phrenology was a bad idea, but organology was a good idea. So we have, uh, we can do a little better than a hand scanner. We can use, for instance, an MEG scanner, which was mentioned today. Um, Nico actually showed some experiments um, using MEG, and or we can also use ECOG, which is a little bloodier and a little bit more, you know, patient-based, obviously. Now, what happens if you put people in into this recording context and you just give them continuous speech? So they're just listening to us, you know, to me carrying on. Um, what these two people um, discovered about 10 years ago, or a little more than that, um, Huan Luo, and uh, was now a professor at Beijing University, and Nai Ding, who actually, as of this week, is also a professor at Beijing University. And they discovered in a series of very simple and clever experiments that the, um, that the brain, the auditory cortex response, unbelievably faithfully tracks the envelope of the speech signal. So it's like the brain waves surf on the speech waves. Right, so this is what's called neural entrainment. Right, so here is the envelope of the speech signal and the uh, signal coming recorded from the auditory cortex just gloms on to that. And so that's um, easy to observe. You can do it, for instance, in ECOG. So this is an experiment by Elana Zion Gollander for some years ago where people were in a context of a cocktail party, or it's a, a not a very good cocktail party. So you're lying in a machine and there's two pictures of people talking and you have to attend to one or the other. So it's a crappy cocktail party. But if you ask a participant to listen to only, this is actually ECOG data. So if you ask the patient to attend to one of the two speakers, so for instance, attend to the female speaker, you get you know, the blue trace. This is single trace, right? This is a single trial of, of six seconds of data. If you ask again, please attend to the female speaker in the next trial, same item. Now for the, now the identical acoustic mixture, right? So both speakers are speaking in the cocktail party thing. So you have two auditory streams and you say attend to the other speaker, um, it gets quite different. So it's under, so you can control which envelope you're tracking and then you see that the tracking is completely conditioned by that. So that was a quite elegant demonstration. Um, Keith Doling did a series of experiments subsequently to show that you actually need this envelope, right? So it's not just, um, fun and games. You actually need to, uh, to, oops. So when you get rid of the signal, uh, when you get rid of aspects of the stimulus envelope that prevent you from locking to it, so you can no longer entrain, your intelligibility goes down. When you reinsert something in this uh, paper from some years ago to, uh, to facilitate entrainment, you get intelligibility back up, even though the phonetics is gone. It's a very beautiful experiment. So what's the, uh, what's the summary of this? Uh, what, you know, why do we think this has been important? Well, it allows you to segment events. So if speech it comes in as a continuous stream, it's very messy, it's fast, it doesn't come pre-labeled. We know you lock on to the envelope of the signal very precisely, and the functional consequence of doing that, of this entrainment, of neural entrainment using low frequency oscillations, is that it basically inserts the white spaces where there were none. So it gives you a broad cut of the signal into temporal primitives of a granularity commensurate with looking for something of roughly the size of a syllable. So that's uh, very useful. So now we have a kind of coarse way of thinking about this. So there's an alignment between, the, between aspects of systems neuroscience, right? So that's the theta rhythm, the modulation spe spectrum of speech, which is between four and five hertz, and mean syllable duration. So we begin to see where there are alignments that allow my uh, the neurophysiological attributes of my auditory cortex to grab on to the physics of the input signal in a way to generate primitives that I can then decode in the next step, which is at least a cool beginning. It's a start. 
How might you do that? I mean, we, can, we have more detailed ways of and caching that out. So the input comes in, it generates a spike train in the afferent auditory pathway. This spike train interacts with intrinsic oscillations in the auditory system and uh, phase resets the uh, oscillations, which in turn changes basically the excitability cycles. So, you know, you can read this all up. It's, it's pretty well worked out what the neurophysiology is supposed to be like. I mean, there, there's a story and there's an engineering story to it and so on. Now, you still might be skeptical, but you should be skeptical. You, know, you say, I still don't like oscillations. You don't have to, but yet you should then read this paper. Um, that's, and this is honoring our location here at the National Academy. This came out last week, I think, in PNAS, that you really do need, uh, you, if you pit these models against each other, one that's simply entrainment by a series of evoked responses versus one that's based on oscillators, the oscillator-based model clearly does better uh, soup to nuts, so there's plenty of evidence to go around. Okay, so there's entrainment, uh, which is a neurophysiological, you know, it's, it's one of the building blocks. Now it goes without saying, I think I have like five minutes or so, is that right? Well, that's for discussion. We don't want discussion. I'm, ag I'm against discussion. Um, so I'm not interested in hearing syllables, I'm interested in understanding what you're saying. So can we actually scale this up. So this is an ex experiment by Nai Ding and Lucia Meloni. So the idea is the fun, this is, it's, it's quick to explain, but it's kind of cool and fun. So the idea is, here's the speech waveform, and here's the envelope. And what I just told you is that we can get, a, we can get a, uh, some, some purchase on the problem of the phonetic decomposition. So this is the sentence, they went on vacation. But what I really need to get out is the sentence, they went on vacation, knowing that this is a pronoun and this is the verb, this is a prepositional phrase, and so on and so forth, right? So that's what I'm actually trying to do. So we had the following idea. Well, if at the syllabic level, as I just showed you, uh, we have a sense of what the neural code, or, well, what one of the necessary neural codes might be, then if at higher orders of this online linguistic hierarchy, the code should change at the commensurate rate. So in particular, so if we have entrainment to the physical signal here, the question is, well, do you then get entrainment to actually abstract things in your head that you have to build? Because they're not in the signal, right? So we have lots of evidence for this. I mean, this is sort of like you can put this in the bank. Um, the interpretation is controversial, but not the data. And the question is, can we get any evidence of this? So the way we did this is to work first with Chinese, then with English, then with German, then with Hebrew, and so on. But I'll just give you a quick example from, from Mandarin and English. So suppose you record individual words, just in a ton of words. You make them all the same length, 250 milliseconds. And this works really well with Chinese because it's uh, every word is every syllable is also a word. And then you concatenate them either to generate sentences or to be like a word list. You know, word list would be like you know eggs, sugar, toilet paper, you know, like a, or real sentences, right? So. For instance, the sentence, dry fur, rub, skin, new plans, gave hope. If I concatenate those sentences, you get isochronous speech, which sounds really annoying. Here, for the Chinese speakers, an example. Correct. <laughs> Whatever that means. Okay, so... Um, the rate at which the signal is coming in is four hertz because we arrange it that way, right? So every syllable is, is isochronously presented, so it's you know, timed completely. But then if you play with the materials correctly, you can arrange it so that the higher order things, so for instance, phrasal information have, changes at two hertz because you have, let's say, a noun phrase occurring there and then a verb phrase. And then at the highest level, you have sentences occurring once per second. So you have a rate of change of one hertz, another one of two hertz, and another one of four hertz happening concurrently. But of course, only this is actually in the signal. Well, the, the bottom one. This is in the signal and the rest is in your head. It's a model that you're building. Here's the English version. Poor friends paid bills, our boss wrote notes, drunk dudes sang hums, fun games, waste time, kind words, warm hearts, tall guys flee, camp rude, cats claw, dogs quiet, lamb ate, grass wood, shelf holds, cans iced, beer cost sense, new plans give hope, large ants built. Imagine nest. doing that for a couple hours. Huh? <laughs> good, good times, good times were had. 
So as you might have experienced, you start to actually hear prosodic structure. You know, you start to hear intonation, but there's no intonation. Right? Everything is actually flat, but you start to superimpose intonation as you begin to hear a structure. So what do we do? We take the poor victims, so Mandarin speakers, American English speakers, we put them in the MEG machine, we have them listen to endless materials like this, and then we analyze now in the frequency domain, what's the brain response to this stuff? Now we know, I just told you 10 minutes ago, uh, I'll pretend it was five minutes ago, that the uh, cortical response entrains precisely to the envelope of the signal. So we better see entrainment to the envelope. And so that would be at four hertz, so it would be the syllable rate. The question is, do you see anything else? And here comes the ooh-ah moment. This is the wow moment. You see everything, right? You see the response to the syllable, which is you know, a known known, but you also track the phrasal rate and the sentential rate. So if this is each, each cherry is a word, you get a response to each cherry, to the grouping of two cherries, and to the grouping of four. But how did you do that? That doesn't come for free. Okay, so quick response to a few reviewers, because reviewers are always irritating. Um, well, these are just subharmonics. No, I can take the entire thing and mix it up together so it's just like a laundry list, so there's no more structure. You can't interpret items together. Then, of course, you still get the reality check that you track the physical rate of the stimulus, because you don't get any of the higher order things. So it's not that. You can do a little mini experiment. You bring in a new bunch of victims, show that it works again. Uh, you just, if you track just a little phrasal chunks, that works. You can do the original experiment again, it works again. Then you can do, let's say, English speakers with Chinese materials. Obviously, they should be able to track the syllables because it's just a physical signal, and they do. But luckily, they're not secretly Chinese speakers. So this would be a good uh, spy thing, right? So if you put someone who says they do not speak a language in this thing and you give them that, the brain will tell you the answer that they're tracking the constituent structure of the item, whether they like it or not. So. That's my, uh, that, that's my contribution to national security, I guess. <laughs> um, of course, you can do the experiment again in English. So, uh, to, to, I mean, there's, there, this experiment goes on and on. Uh, the paper, I highly recommend it, five stars on Yelp. Uh, <laughs> there's, we then have to go and answer other reviewer comments that are very reasonable, like, is this, just, is this actually you superimposing grammatical knowledge on the input stream, or is it actually tracking the statistical structure? So we did a, a lot of interesting little experiments. I mean, we had Zach talk about Markovian properties of the world. We actually taught people, uh, we exposed them to a Markov language and had them spend the entire uh, good times in the lab hearing actually this for fun. I'll play you this to make you crazy. John speaks Dutch. Her dad wrote a book. Her dad speaks French. Jess wrote a poem. Her dad didn't answer. A girl speaks Russian. The boy wrote a story. The boy didn't move. John didn't come. Her dad speaks English. Imagine doing that for a day. Why is that useful? Because at every point you are, there's always a one over five chance uh, where you were. I mean, the, so the transition probability at every point is, is a fifth. So that won't override a lifetime of experience, but it will put you in that set. If you then get those materials, the question is, are you tracking the statistical structure of the input that you, uh, <laughs> you forced into their head? Or actually, are you still sensitive to constituency? And the answer, unsurprisingly, otherwise I wouldn't show you, is you're sensitive to constituency. You can't override the idea of building constituents that you need to interpret. Um, this scales up nicely to naturalistic speech. Obviously, you know, we don't speak isochronously in these weird things. You can do experiments that mix this up. You can then you know, do different analysis. A last point, just because I think it's relevant, people want to know where in the brain is this. Uh, you then thank your reviewer number five, or whoever you were. You cost me like 50 grand. So, so it's one of you. I mean, just if somebody says, oh, get some ECOG data. As if that were just a thing, you know, get some ECOG data. So we did get some ECOG data um, on a bunch of patients and did the English version of this experiment. And here, I just want to show you one cool and weird thing, since I'm at 39 minutes and 10 seconds. Um, Look at these here. So these are the so this this is uh, the frequency response of the brain. By, these are the electrodes. The red are the electrodes that actually only respond to the constituent structure, but not to the stimulus itself. Isn't that cool? So these are now. It would be nice to have way more data on this, but 
So it shows you that the, uh, the, the uh, operation of actually taking two things and sticking them together for interpretation is building hierarchical constituents online is actually not just in one splotch, but is actually in lots of different places. You can do it in different analyses. Okay, summary and the end here. So cortical circuits uh, generate slow rhythms that can match the time scales of larger linguistic structures, even when the rhythms actually don't present it, obviously. So how would you do that? How can you track such a thing? How would you get such a result? You can't use auditory information because there are no acoustic cues like prosody or intonation contour. Um, you can't use probability because we got rid of it. So a very simple explanation is you have a grammar in your head. And that grammar in your head actually constructs, that is the model that you use through, and you filter the world to actually build the constituent structure with which you interpret what's going on. So that's uh, what I think. So oscillations are, they're not a map of syntax, they're an administrative unit that give you kind of temporal primitives that allow you to, uh, on which you want to do the next operation. So they're basically like a computational mid-level uh, secretary. My goodbye message is that if we want to do neuroscience, and I do, we need cognitive science to do neuroscience and not be completely sterile or just stuck at the level of describing uh, only the implementation level. We need some kind of behavior or cognitive science. And John Krakauer and uh, Gazan Far Gomez Marin MacGyver and I wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago uh, that was not so well received. And maybe it was our tone. But it may have been the tone. There may have some tonal aberration. But the, uh, but the point is that you know, if you really want explanation, you, know, you might as well look to Aristotle, who actually had a good theory, like a really good theory, or Tinbergen, who had a very interesting way of thinking about the problem in neuroethological terms, or Marr, if you want. But you have to have a story. You can't just keep describing this stuff, do a lot of biology, and then say, and therefore autism. Right? That's insulting. So. If you're going to study, the, you know, be serious about the cognitive science of the psychology, whatever you want to call it, and really you know, be componential, be aggressive. So I started with a public service announcement, and let me end with a public service announcement of a slightly different form, um, which is because, you know, I, which is uh, we live in interesting times and not the good kind of interesting. And we're here uh, extremely privileged because we're uh, the folks who have actually the education and the capability of looking at evidence. We have access to evidence. We have the availability to evaluate evidence. And so it's our responsibility to actually be serious about that too. So since the world is complicated right now, uh, to just stand by is not good enough. It's definitely not good enough. So Einstein said a, a nice thing. The world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. And we can't get away with that, and we shouldn't, as the people who have access to information and access to evaluation. So Chomsky rightly said, it's the responsibility of intellectuals to speak the truth and expose lies. And we shouldn't forget in the fun we have in our science that we're also citizens. So try to remember that too. So thanks for your attention.